so yes, uh, I'm Richard, and then I'll be doing the uh, first part uh, of the presentation, and then uh, Alana is going to take over the second part of the presentation, and then uh, I guess we'll be good for questions. All right, uh, just so to kind of introduce the topic, uh, we're going to talk about uh, as a kind of a case study, this particular insect that's before you, this is called a power chic skipperling. And uh, this, is, this is a butterfly, but it's in a subgroup uh, from most of the butterflies that you would know, and they are called skippers. And uh, they are uh, characterized by having little tiny hooks at the end of their antennae, where regular butterflies just swollen end with no hooks. And these skippers are uh, generally uh, more heavily bodied and quite hairy, as you can see in this one. And um, they're, they're the uh, certainly only members of the butterfly uh, group family that can actually split their wings, uh, their front wings from their back wings. So in this case, you see this power sheet skipperling and uh, she has put her fore wings straight up and her hind wings can go out horizontally. And I think the other thing you notice that she's really, really cute. So that's one of the reasons we love working on these types of things. So I'm going to talk about this particular species and the approach. Uh, how do you manage um, an endangered species when you really have limited knowledge of its life history, its biology, ecology, and the habitats that it prefers to uh, breed in? Uh, so we'll just jump right into it. So we have here really a uh, situation uh, where we have a, a butterfly, uh, a Rhizma power chic, that has been elevated to endangered status, both in here and the United States. It's now globally imperiled. But it was once a very common insect, and it was once very locally common, where you may find hundreds of individuals within a few hectares um, of habitat. Um, and it was once found in 10 provinces, and, pardon me, 10 provinces and states. And um, primarily decline really occurred. Usually we kind of classify it into the uh, time period from probably the late 1880s to about the 1940s, 1950s, when we lost most of the tall grass prairie in North America. And we only have a very small uh, area left. And these are mostly in remnant patches and uh, in protected areas, uh, a lot of it. And then these, the population stabilized and it was still quite abundant in the, uh, you know, the stable remnants uh, over the lap period from about 1970 to 2000. And then it suddenly started to drop again and very precipitously. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that and, and talk about how we can recover a species like this and um, hopefully sustain it for the long term. Um, in this uh, particular diagram here, we can see the, on the left-hand side, is kind of the historical range of the tall grass prairie. And um, the uh, disappearance of the tall grass prairie was so quick in North America due to colonization and the arrival of your, your settlement that uh, we have a pretty good idea of where the tall grass prairie was, but in some areas it disappeared so fast that it wasn't even documented. So on the right-hand side is the, um, what we think is probably the uh, true range of power chic skipperling if we go back before uh, the arrival of European settlers, settlers and the loss of the tall grass prairie. So it was very abundant in uh, a number of states. Um, it could have even been in Missouri and even in Nebraska and it probably was. But the best records we can find is this, this area here was uh, uh, the main uh, focus of uh, skipperling habitat. And I just bring to your attention the uh, circle at the top here. This is the population we're going to be talking about uh, this presentation. Okay, so the entire Canadian population is found in Manitoba and the entire population is found in an area called the Tall Grass Prairie Preserve. It's the largest tall grass prairie preserve in Canada. And it's about 6,000, uh, uh, pardon me, the, the original tall grass prairie was around 6,000 square kilometers in Manitoba. 
And that's now been reduced to about 50 square kilometers uh, since um, our most recent inventories, which were the late 1990s. And the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve is around uh, 5,000 hectares. So that gives you an idea of the size of it. Um, at the lowest point, uh, we had about 50 individuals left in Canada, and that was about three years ago. And uh, if you look at this map down on the lower left, the black dots uh, plus the green dots um, represent populations of this species between about eight and 1980 and 2000 that were robust. There was many, many individuals at those. Each one of those black dots, so we go through North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, have now um, all been extirpated. There are uh, no longer any viable populations there. Uh, by 2000, there was only three populations, one in Manitoba, one in a couple of prairie fens in southern Michigan, and one in Wisconsin. The site in Wisconsin has now been extirpated and has been negative for the last 10 years. So now we just have two uh, populations left. And uh, what you'll be seeing here is uh, because this is a, an endemic tall grass prairie species, it's tied directly to these habitats, that um, disturbance is a very important factor in the regulation and survival of the species. And you'll see that we'll talk about that quite a bit. Okay, so uh, we've broken the talk into two components. I'm going to be dealing with the first component here. So a little bit about life history and habitat, food plants, climate change, and how important uh, managing disturbance is to these habitats. And then Alana is going to really uh, talk about um, how we figure out where they are, the distribution and modeling, and looking at the reintroduction of uh, the species. Okay, just a little bit on life history. Uh, this is an example of uh, adults. Uh, this is the dorsal or top surface, and this is the ventral surface. Pawashi skipperling is about five or six centimeters, uh, depends on the size, but the wingspan's about five or six centimeters, up to eight centimeters. There's one generation a year, we call that univoltine. And um, the uh, primary identifying characteristics in the wild are on the undersides, we have uh, these scales, white scales on the uh, hind wing veins uh, with orangey brown scales in the middle and these chocolate flashes uh, on each side. So they are actually quite easy to identify in the field uh, once you um, are familiar with uh, working with them. Okay, so the first of our research objectives when we first, when we first started this work in the early 2000s, uh, was to learn about its biology and ecology and understand basically um, how that was uh, kind of integrated into plant diversity, uh, plant structure, and the soil characteristics of habitats. Now, I have to preface this a little bit because despite being extremely common, very little research was done on this species um, in uh, the United States and none in Canada actually. Uh, very little research was done, and most of the publications, a few that are available on life history, date back to the 1950s and 60s, and nothing in the 70s or 80s uh, until we have a publication uh, in the 80s on the discovery of the Canadian population. I think this was probably because this was once a very common little butterfly. And the other thing is because it's a prairie specialist, it's a grass feeder, these uh, types of insects are incredibly hard to rear in captivity. And it turns out that nobody had actually reared this species at all up until we started the work um, to try to rear it in, in the laboratory. Uh, so, and that didn't start till about 2012, 2014. Uh, so we really had no information on the uh, actual interactions of the species in its environment. The other thing we really wanted to look at as well is uh, we wanted to be able to predict when the adults emerge because the adult flight period is very critical, of course, for doing surveys, but also for observing egg laying and, uh, and hoping to find larvae so we can carry out our research on. So we developed a, a degree day model to help us predict um, when the adults would be out and when we should be out surveying. All the pictures you see are past graduate students um, that have worked here at the University of Winnipeg in my lab. Uh, 
over the last 20 years uh, working on um, figuring out um, the life history and biology of the species. Um, another thing we really wanted to concentrate on was the management. Now, in the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, this is uh, mainly um, a uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada property, uh, but it also has some provincial uh, government ownership, and it also has some nonprofit ownership. There's a group called the Manitoba Natural Society. So between the three organizations, they basically uh, carry out all the management and are responsible responsible for overseeing all the activities in this 5,000 hectare area. We also didn't even know what the adults fed on primarily and how important um, uh, the presence of nectar sources was. And probably the most important thing, we really didn't know uh, what the larvae fed on. So it's pretty hard to rear it in captivity when you don't even know what the larvae feed on. Okay, just a little bit on the life cycle. Uh, it's a pretty busy slide. Uh, but I think the important points is adults are flying usually at the end of June to early July. Uh, mating occurs usually within the first few days of adult occlusion uh, from the pupa. Um, eggs are laid uh, often within minutes after mating or um, for an extensive period up to about five to ten days. Larvae feed on grasses. The eggs are actually uh, laid sometimes on the host plant, which we know now, but we didn't know then. But they're also laid on non-host plants. And that's why when you look into the uh, past publications on uh, potential life history of this particular species, um, people would uh, document uh, host plants uh, that were not host plants at all, but just where the, larvae, uh, the adults had laid the eggs. The larvae actually have to move off these and then seek their host plants. So uh, when we started this work, um, we didn't know actually what the larvae fed on in the wild. Uh, just a listing on the side here is uh, different graduate students and pub publications of people that have been working both here and, and in the US. Uh, we have a large group of people, about 50 individuals uh, within all the US states. We have the USDA Wildlife Service. Uh, we have uh, the Canadian Federal service and then we have some universities and provincial people as well involved. So there's a working group, it's called the Power Sheik International Working Group. And we also have two zoos involved in this group. This group was formed in 2008 and uh, has been working together ever since to recover the species in both Canada and the US. Um, once uh, we reach uh, end of August, beginning of September, uh, the larvae will go into diapause. We're not even sure yet exactly which instar, but we think it's between fourth and fifth instar. Once in diapause, they spend the winter at the base of the host plant, in this case of grass, uh, under the snow, and then they break diapause. We uh, think usually uh, beginning to middle of May. Pupate in, they feed again, pupate in June, and then the cycle repeats. Okay, so we had some really basic questions that nobody had answered, uh, had, well, they'd asked it, but they hadn't answered it before. So we wanted to compare different sites uh, under different management regimes, and that could be grazing, mowing, or uh, burning. Uh, we wanted to look at the plant diversity between site types, and also we wanted to look at uh, if there's a correlation between the density of adults at each site and the plant diversity and structure and biomass as well. Succession occurs surprisingly quickly in something like the tall grass prairie. You can think of forest succession uh, and you can see in the boreal forest, depending on where you're located and the species that you're working with, succession may continue over a hundred years or 60 years. It really depends on uh, the primary dominant tree species. But in something like the tall grass prairie succession occurs uh, uh, often in five to 10 years, you can have significant changes in the plant structure, uh, the diversity and the biomass. Uh, we had to figure out uh, what uh, the food plants were, uh, adult nectar plants, and um, what would be an optimal uh, burn, graze, or mow management approach. Um, I'm not gonna to spend uh, too much time on these slides. Suffice to say, one of the most important things we had to look at was soil and soil related uh, parameters. 
And the reason we had to do this is a lot of these uh, host plants, there's many, many species of grasses in the tall grass prairie, and they grow in different conditions, different moisture conditions. They also require different micronutrients. Um, so we can, um, in our early work, it quickly became obvious that uh, certain grasses were growing in certain parts of the prairie. For example, compacted sites had, uh, say, poa species uh, were the dominant. In early burns, we had uh, a different set of species. And then they were associated uh, with um, different uh, kinds of compaction, soil texture, and uh, micronutrients. Uh, so we kind of had to tease um, all of this out. Uh, and in our early work, it, it became quite clear that power sheet skipperling really bred only in those sites and, and utilized those sites. It had a very particular diversity of plants and a, a suite of um, soil and soil related parameters. Uh, we were able to discover that uh, this species primarily feeds on only two plants. One was the black eyed Susan, the other is upland, upland white goldenrod aster. And almost 90% of the time, uh, adults feed only on these two species, despite there being a number of other species available at the time that adults are uh, in uh, during the flight period, they really just need these two species. So for our initial results uh, going through the early 2000s, we found that uh, short rotational burning is definitely not a good thing for a species like power sheep skipperling. Now, you kind of have to think that pre-colonization uh, times, um, these prairies were exceptionally large and you could have patch fires and adults could easily colonize other areas or recolonize from non-burnt areas. But once you shrink down the habitat available, um, and especially when you block it in such a way that there's maybe no corridors between uh, patches, we start to see that um, a species like this is very susceptible to uh, basically what we would call, uh, you know, not the appropriate disturbance type. So two to three year uh, burn cycles uh, generally cause a decline. Poorly timed grazing or uh, too in high intensity of grazing. So that means the number of calf um, uh, the number of animal and plus, uh, mother plus calf units on these sites uh, will remove nectar sources. High density grazing and high moisture uh, causes a lot of trampling, so we get loss of immatures. Ten-year burn rotations will also lead to decline because succession has reached a point where you have high invasion of woody material, shrubby material, and a loss of uh, host plants. And we found that probably a 47 year burn rotation um, or uh, very, very light grazing after mid July, after the adults have finished egg laying, was uh, probably uh, one of the best approaches. Uh, I said we did develop a degree day uh, temperature. This is Catherine Dearborn, one of the students we've had. She's now a postdoc here at the University of Winnipeg. And we were able to predict emergence uh, for the, well, we started in the late. 2008, 9, and 10, and over the last 10 or 15 years, we can usually uh, predict divergence within 24 to 48, sometimes 72 hours. So we're able to get out to the sites. These sites are quite spread out. There's quite a few of them, although they are fairly small and they're quite a distance from Winnipeg. So we can get out and do our work for the adult flight period when we need to. Uh, the next thing we wanted to do was we wanted to look at microhabitats. And, Power sheep skipperling and many of these endangered type skipper species spend almost 95% of their life cycle in a little patch, as you see here, only maybe a meter or two wide. And these microhabitat patches are integrated into the matrix of the tall grass prairie. And we wanted to be able to identify sites where we think that the microhabitat uh, patches would be quite numerous because. If you're burning or if you're uh, grazing, uh, there needs to be an approach where certain sites are not damaged or are not grazed or not burnt. Maybe adjacent area that has some sites will be, but there can be some movement back and forth. Um, so we worked quite uh, stringently with a number of different students to classify all these microsites based on their vegetative, edaphic, and physical factors. And uh, we wanted to have uh, kind of a 
a really closely focused look at each site and, and then move it down to almost the patch level in designing um, ways to avoid disturbing these sites when we do general um, disturbance requirements for the prairie. Um, this was uh, a project that we just recently completed where we now wanted to actually find the larvae in the field. And these larvae are less than a centimeter long. And of course they're green and camouflage and extremely challenges to find. I guess they've been so uh, challenging that nobody had ever documented the larvae in the wild. And we took these containers, uh, believe it or not, there's probably 10 different grass species in there. And we placed them, uh, these containers went over areas where we followed females. We followed females for several weeks, for a couple of years. Whenever they laid an egg, we uh, marked the egg and then we started placing containers over them. There's a hobo meter in the bottom. And we wanted to kind of figure out uh, what the larvae were doing, what they were feeding on. And so for the first time, we found that larvae actually feed on four different species of grass. Uh, those four species are listed here. This is big blue stem, little blue stem, Mount Mully, and this is prairie drop seed. And when we look at the density of larvae and adults at sites, we find that the distribution of these species is actually quite a bit different, um, which we hadn't been expecting. And we also found that larvae uh, will move from each of those four species of grass. And they may feed on one for two days and then crawl over to another uh, different species for a couple of days and then onto another species. They would not feed on any other species. And don't forget all of these uh, species are integrated in this thick mat with a lot of non-host species. So it was remarkable to see that these little tiny larvae crawled up to almost half to three quarters of a meter in a month traveling between these stems um, in this area. So from all that work, we were able to uh, basically choose areas in the tall grass prairie that we felt um, cap uh, captured where all the activities were. And after following, uh, following adults, following larvae, we found that adults primarily feed in these red areas, which is dry music upland prairie, where the nectar species are concentrated. The females, the mating occurs here as well, but the females then fly into an intermediate area between the swampy uh, marshy areas. Eggs are laid in these areas, and this turns out to be where we get that kind of um, magic mixture of those four species. Once we get into the upland, we have less diversity and more dry grass species. And once we get into the wet, uh, pardon me, the, the dry land and then into the wetland, we get um, a lot of species like uh, sedges and uh, rushes and things like that. And it turns out that the females or males don't enter into this area. They're basically confined to this. And they absolutely don't go near any forest or shrubby areas at all. So they are quite confined. And so we get this gradient all through the tall grass prairie of the little tiny patches um, that may be only a few hundred meters in size that go from dry to wet. Power Seek Skipperling does most of its reproductive activity in this area. And then the foraging activity for nutrients are in this area. And uh, just to give you an idea, there's your four species and the larvae continually move from species to species, ignoring all the other grass species. Okay, so we know a lot about the life history. Uh, and here we see a pupa. This is a, a pupa almost ready to emerge. In this one, the eyes are just visible. But as you can see, it's extremely hard and uh, tedious work crawling on in your hands and knees for week after week trying to look for uh, these little uh, larvae and pupa in the field. But we did certainly identify the host plants, um, egg laying behavior, courtship behaviors, and we have now worked out the microhabitats. So we know a bit about the life history uh, that basically we'd started off from zero. And then we can now design uh, various management activities 
around our understanding of how this particular species utilizes its habitat. And just to finish off this little part here, um, at the same time, we've been working with the Minnesota Zoo in Minneapolis and the Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg. And once we've kind of got an idea of what was happening in the field, they've now been able to take, uh, collect um, eggs from our sites. And uh, also in the United States, they've collected eggs from the Michigan sites and taken them to the Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota Zoo. And they've got a full room program. They've been actually able to now make them in captivity for the first time. So we're really, really thrilled. Um, this is Laura Burns and CJ Breiter, uh, one of my ex-graduate students. And now at both zoos, they are rearing them. And we've had our first introductions over the last couple of years. And we're now kind of almost ready to go into a large introduction stage. We just, we've been kind of pioneering and, and working kind of slow with very small introductions to kind of get the whole system down. But we now can rear them in captivity and um, uh, things are looking a lot brighter. Okay, I'm going to leave that now. So I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, Alana is going to, uh, I just let me get this slide here. Alana's gonna take over. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. Great, thank you, Richard, uh, for bringing us up to speed on two decades of work on the ecology, biology, and uh, habitat of the species. Just want to check, you can see my screen? Folks can see yeah. my screen? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, as you may guess, uh, I am uh, related to Richard Westwood. I'm Alana Westwood at uh, DAL in the School for Resource Environmental Studies here in Gedjabuktuk, also known as Halifax. Um, but I grew up in Winnipeg and was lucky enough to work some of my first biology, environmental, science-related jobs as a research associate in tall grass prairie, getting to know these ecosystems, learning the tediousness that is grass identification, if, every, if anyone's ever had that unique pleasure, and working on this a super adorable species among a, a whole suite of, of endangered species in this region. So, you know, after these, these two decades of work that Richard and his lab has done, uh, we now have knowledge of a good habitat for Powashik skipperling, which is fantastic. Uh, we also have successful captive breeding. So, have we recovered the Canadian population? Not quite yet. There's still a couple more things that need to be done. So, what I'm going to talk to you about is this second piece. We know what the good habitat is we understand the management regime that's needed. And now we need to look at opportunities across the landscape uh, for reintroducing this species. So identifying good habitat um, across the ecoregion, new sites for introduction, opportunities to establish new populations and to restock um, previous populations, as well as identify where maybe we can manage to restore uh, tall grass into that, into that um, status that is suitable for Powashik skipperling. So that's that's the part that I'm going to share. Quick recap in case uh, you zoned out uh, over the last 20 minutes or so. So we're working with a critically imperiled population. We may have less than 50 individuals on the landscape. They're all in this one tall grass prairie preserve, which are the white uh, boxes in the in the middle of the screen at the bottom of this satellite map. And they're all in the same ecoregion. So you've probably encountered ecological classification. We have eco, um, eco zones, eco regions, eco sections. So they're all in the same eco region, what's called the Steinbach eco region. So if we're going to recover this species, we can't just have them in this small area. We need genetic diversity. We need more connectivity. So not only do we need to restock existing populations, we need to find locations to establish new populations. And we have to do it fast. One bad winter in Manitoba could finish the species because there's so few and because they're all in such a small area. So we need to be accurate with our selection of sites um, for these reintroduction management opportunities. So uh, I work among other things on spatial modeling and spatial prioritization for conservation. So that's how I got re-engaged after working as a research assistant on this through about 
2003 through 2009. Um, I left this project for a while, came, did my PhD here at Dell, uh, with Cindy Stacer, nice to see you. Um, and then got re-engaged to work on the landscape ecology piece of this project. So species distribution models are um, mathematical models that predict the distribution of a species across the landscape, depending on the data you have. So you can predict uh, where the species occur, how abundant it is, or where it occupies. And you can use those results to make maps like this heat map on the top right that shows you where you're likely to find that species or where the good habitat is. And it can help you guide conservation and management actions. Almost all species distribution models, and this is a really common method, I'm sure some of you are using it, um, are validated statistically. There's tens of thousands of them, maybe hundreds of thousands now, um, and they're validated using statistical methods. But the only way to really know if a species distribution model is accurate is to collect data based on the output of your model in the field and then validate it using those data. Because that's expensive and difficult, it's not done very often. In fact, at the time of working on this, I could only find four papers that had done field val verification. However, we, because of the need for accuracy and we're working in a fairly small area, we decided that we should take that extra step and do that field validation to make sure that the model that we're giving to managers like the province, like this working group um, that we're talking about can rely on the information and be able to make good decisions. So this, uh, this project that I'm speaking about is now published in Conservation Science uh, and Practice, so you can read the details there. But the objective was to create a species distribution model for the Pauschik Skipperling in Manitoba, um, calibrate it to predict habitat quality rather than species occurrence. I'll explain that in a moment. And then to field validate the accuracy of the model. The methods we used was called Maxent. If you're familiar with distribution modeling, you've probably encountered it. And the applications were to survey for new populations. So maybe we find areas of good habitat that we haven't explored yet, and perhaps we get lucky and go check them out and find a population, and more likely locating potential sites to introduce this species to establish new populations. So the very basics of model building here is you you designate a study area, so we have that Steinbach ecoregion as our study area. You pick environmental covariates that you think explain why a species chooses to be or is where it is. Um, you add information about presence, so where do you actually know that that species is, and then you spit that out in a predictive model. But how you pick those environmental covariates is very important, and this is something that, that modelers we discuss a lot. You know, people will often kind of go fishing. They'll pick a lot of environmental covariates based on the spatial data that are available. But it's really important to link those as closely as possible to the actual life history needs of the species. So from the species eye view, why does this butterfly or caterpillar choose a certain patch and not another? And how can we represent that with spatial data? So thanks to the work Richard has done, uh, we have a really clear idea of sort of this species niche, what it needs for cover and shelter, the management regime, what kind of food for adults and larvae, how it's impacted by a disturbance. So we were able to take all that information, we grouped it into kind of three sort of niche requirement uh, groups, so cover and shelter, adult food plant availability, and larval plants and reproduction, and then we're able to look at factors that could be modeled on a landscape scale. Ideally, we would know the location of every stem of Black-Eyed Susan in the prairie and be able to put that into the model, but we don't. So we had to use proxy covariates at a landscape scale, like delineation of the borders of prairie ecosystems, moisture regimes, temperature regimes, soil type, that kind of thing. So ultimately, we had three kind of layer groups that went into the model for environmental covariates, land cover, microclimate, and disturbance. Um, I won't explain all the details here, but overall, we're looking at, you know, where is the prairie? What is the configuration and size and type of these patches? We wanted to look at vegetation height um, using LIDAR data, but we couldn't get the data for the full coverage of the area, so we couldn't use it. 
For microclimate, again, because these tiny patches are so important, um, we built insulation models. So how much energy is coming from the sun, soil type and soil drainage. Disturbance, we uh, used distance to wetlands as a proxy for flood risk. We wanted to come up with more accurate proxies like a wetness index, but we weren't able to do so because the, the resolution of the data wasn't there. We also wanted to use years since burn because as we know, that's very important for whether or not Powashiks can use that habitat. Unfortunately, the data were also very inconsistent and not at an appropriate resolution. So we were unable to include as much information about disturbance as, uh, as we wanted to. So on the right here is an example of a covariate. So this one is seasonal radiation in the Steinbach Eco District. That was built by Colin Murray and Kara Pearson also helped out with this work. Um, so we put together a bunch of layers that looked much like that, raster layers of all these different covariates, and then added in our presence of where we know power sheep skipperlings are. We had super specific presence data from Richard's lab, which has been collecting it for the last 20 years. So those are the black dots on the map. We were able to use 180 locations and uh, ultimately produced uh, a map that showed what is the probability of occurrence of the Powshik Skipperling. And I'll show you that map in a moment. But first, I'm gonna come back to this hat thing. So this is really important if you're doing a species distribution model. Probability of occurrence and habitat quality are not the same thing. Some people use the words uh, species distribution model and habitat model or habitat suitability model as interchangeable. And this is a huge pet peeve of mine. They're not. So where a species might occur, habitat is good for that species may not necessarily be the same thing. In the case of the skipperling, we know where they all occur. Um, Richard's lab has been literally following them around on hands and knees for decades. We know every, basically every individual in the population. So that's not so important. What's important is finding good habitat for management and reintroduction. So we had to calibrate the model. We had to change probability of occurrence, match that up against known habitat quality, and calibrate it to then predict habitat quality on the landscape. Um, and a uh, former grad student of Richard's, Carrie-Anne LaFrance, helped us with this. Uh, she and Richard, uh, who are both you know, experts in tall grass prairie and these species, developed a field rating system for habitat. So habitat quality was moved into four categories, excellent, good, medium, or poor, and had this really specific extensive list for each category about what species are there? How wet is it? What does the physical landscape look like? How big is the prairie patch? How disturbed is it? Are there host species there? Are there nectar species there? So taking this new field rating system, which had been actually developed for uh, a species like this to my knowledge in Manitoba, uh, uh, Carrie Ann and Richard went out and walked through a hundred and uh, 1,451 30 by 30 meter areas in the tall grass prairie. So every single square you see on these maps, and these are cut out maps of a much bigger area, was walked through by one of these two, and they counted, is this excellent, good, medium, or poor habitat? Then I took the probability of occurrence map, which is where might this species occur, and looked at um, for a threshold or a break point. So Maxent modeling, species distribution modeling, when you're looking at occurrence, gives you an index. Zero, the species is not at all likely to occur there. One, the species is almost certainly going to occur there. So it's an index of zero to one. And when I calibrated that threshold, what I found was that habitat that was good or excellent in the field corresponded to a probability of occurring 0.73 or higher, and habitat that was poor or medium 0.73 or lower. So that gave us a break point that I could then apply across the whole landscape, not just this little tall grass prairie preserve. So something I probably should have mentioned is these squares that they went out to were all in tall grass prairie preserve where we know the species is. So looking at what's good habitat, not good habitat in that region. 
So once we were calibrated, I could then send them out even further across the whole ecoregion. So I was able to come up with expected habitat qualities. If it was that over that 0.73 um, threshold, I expected it to be good or excellent habitat. If it was below that 0.73 threshold in the model, I expected it to be poor or medium. So they were given 108 locations, all of these orange dots all over the eco district, 200 kilometers by 150 kilometers, uh, drove around. We kept them within 100 meters of a road or a trail so that, uh, well, we weren't trespassing and you could make a visual without having the bushwhack too far. And then I was able to calculate from the field rating uh, that Carrie Ann and Richard did, how that matched up against the model for the entire eco region. So here's the model. Red areas are where you're likely to find power sheep skipperling. So you have a predicted probability of occurrence of greater than about 0.7, that's in red. Blue areas, you're almost certainly not going to find it. Predicted probability of occurrence is pretty close to zero. And then we have some in the middle. Ultimately, this whole eco district, less than 1% of it was above that 0.73 threshold. So that means less than 1% of this eco district uh, had a good or excellent expected habitat quality class. Not amazing. But it includes a lot more areas than just the tall grass prairie preserve, which is basically all of the red area at the bottom. So it does give us some other places that we can look for good or excellent habitat. When we looked at the model performance statistically, uh, we got a super great result, 0.98 for the area under the curve, which is probably a bit spurious. I'll talk about that in the moment. So in a moment. So we got a really high statistical validation number. But how did that pan out in terms of our field validation accuracy? So as able, you know, as Richard and Carrie Ann went out to all of those 108 sites for the eco district, you know, they didn't know if they were going into something that was expected to be good or bad. And then they went out there and they rated it. Is this excellent, good, um, medium or poor? And when we looked at those four classes and broke it, so the observed habitat quality against the expected habitat quality, all of the excellent sites corresponded to a probability of occurrence of above 0.75. All of the poor sites corresponded to a probability of occurrence of less than 0.75, so that's good. But there was a lot in the middle. As you can see in this graph, the sites that they rated as good in the field range all the way from nearly zero up to one and medium was also similar. So we collapsed the classes into two, uh, just good, excellent, medium, poor. And overall our accuracy of expected habitat quality class and observed habitat quality class was 83%, pretty good. Uh, kappa is the value you, you use for comparing these things statistically, 0.48, not awesome, but better than expected by chance. Importantly though, the accuracy was very high for sites that were observed as medium or poor, and low for sites that, we, that were observed as good or excellent. So what does that mean? <clears throat> well, ultimately, our model predicted medium poor habitat really well. So if you go back to this model, you can take everything that's medium poor. So the threshold that we had for this was 0.73, that break point. Don't even look at it for reintroduction or management. However, we didn't predict good, excellent habitat as well from the model. So you can flag those areas, but go out and check them out, investigate them in the field before you decide, okay, we're gonna pick this site for reintroduction or management. Um, our observed AUC uh, area under the curve was 0.98 up to a maximum of one. That's very high sort of statistical accuracy is a way of interpreting that. That's likely inflated due to spatial autocorrelations or working in such a small area. And modelers have been saying we can't rely on these statistics because they don't pan out um, when you look at accuracy in the field. And our, our experience suggests that, you know, our overall accuracy is only 83% compared to 98% for statistical accuracy. Um, although it was only 83%, when compared to those few other papers, 
that looked at field validated accuracy, ours was actually higher. So that was a nice little ego boost. Um, so overall, I really want to echo calls from experts in the species distribution modeling field to try to validate your species distribution models whenever you can, especially if they're going to be used in the real world for conservation and management purposes, and especially if accuracy and speed are essential, like they are for this little butterfly. We'd like to do these models again uh, once we have more information on disturbance and climate change. That information is coming. There's more data being collected. Uh, so that would help us generate and clean even more useful and accurate model. So where to now? Well, um, right now, uh, you may remember Catherine Dearborn was introduced, uh, former undergraduate of, in Richard's lab, now postdoc. She's taking this model approach and adapting it for another endangered prairie butterfly, the Dakota skipper. Um, there's large scale releases planned for the Powashik skipperling for new habitats over the next five years in Canada and US. So our model will directly be used to help select some of those. Um, also, there's efforts going on, sort of rural policy efforts to identify critical habitat, and then ultimately refining these habitat management recommendations uh, for both Powashik skipperling. And uh, Richard's lab is also working intensively on the Dakota skipper. So thank you for listening. There's a lot of people that have funded and participated in this. It's been a huge project over um, several decades and so many hands and so much time spent uh, picking ticks off of ourselves in the tall grass prairie. So um, thanks and we are more than happy to take your questions. <laughs>